two dangerous lies about men. Today, we are focusing on two dangerous lies about men. Lie 1. Strong men have no emotions. The life of King David serves as a powerful example of a man who expressed his emotions genuinely before God and others. In the book of Psalms, we witness David's heartfelt and royal expressions of sorrow, joy, and anger. His Psalms are a reflection of his deep and authentic relationship with God, where he poured out his heart honestly, without reservation in moments of sorrow and despair. David didn't hide his feelings or put on a facade of strength. Instead, he openly lamented before God, seeking comfort and solace. In Psalm 42.3, he writes, My tears have been my food day and night while people say to me all day long, Where is your God? David's vulnerability expressing his grief demonstrates that it is not weak for men to show their emotions, but rather a human and honest response to life's challenges. You might be tempted to believe that David was just a weak emotional mess. He wasn't. Allow me to tell you more about David. David was indeed a man's man, a brave and courageous warrior who led from the front lines. Unlike some kings who might have delegated military duties to others, David actively participated in battles alongside his men. David was a man, a militant man, a strong man, a fearless man, a courageous man without a shadow of a doubt. He is Israel's greatest king in the Old Testament. Allow me to tell you more about David. Whilst he was a boy, David was busy killing lions and bears. Whilst other boys were busy being children and growing up, David was killing lions and bears. 1 Samuel 17, 34 through to 36, And David said unto Saul, Thy servant kept his father's sheep, and there came a lion and a bear and took a lamb out of the flock. And I went out after him, and smote him, and delivered it out of his mouth. And when he arose against me, I caught him by his beard and smote him and slew him. Thy servant slew both the lion and the bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be as one of them, seeing he hath defied the armies of the living God. We gloss over this point. We gloss over the courage that David had as a little boy. The same courage made him a great king. Back in those days, these two vicious predators roamed the Holy Land. That was no small feat, killing a lion. But that's the man who David was. He was a warrior from birth. Even as a king, David was a warrior. He was not like the kings of this day and age. David was on the front line with his men. David was a king that would be in the trenches with his men. David and his men went and killed 200 Philistines and cut their foreskins off and went and presented them before the king. David was no average man. Songs were sung about David and the men he killed in battle. So the women sang as they danced and said, Saul has slain his thousands and David his ten thousands. David was a militant man. He was not the type of man that would run from the battle. Whilst other men ran away from the war, he would run to that battle. He ran after the lion. He ran after the bear. He was a radical man. He had a portfolio of dead bodies behind him, giants, lions, bears, armies, all dead at the hand of David. And David understood that it was the Lord who had trained his hands for war and his fingers for battle. David was known for his bravery and strength on the battlefield. He defeated the giant Goliath and led his armies to victory in many battles. David was a fierce warrior and his military prowess earned him a reputation as a mighty man of valor. But David was also a man of deep emotion. He was known to weep and mourn openly, and his heart was sensitive to the pain of others. He wrote many of the Psalms, which are filled with expressions of both joy and sorrow. David was not afraid to show his emotions, and he poured his heart out to God in prayer and worship. Throughout his life, David expressed his emotion through song and or weeping. David's emotional side is perhaps most apparent in his relationship with God. He loved God with all his heart and he was not afraid to express his feelings openly. In Psalm 42, David writes as the deer pants for streams of water. 
so my soul pants for you, my God. David's love for God was deep and genuine, and it drove him to pursue God with all his heart. It is interesting to see that David struggled with depression at times. It is interesting to see that David was in the pit of despair at times. Arguably, the greatest warrior in the Old Testament went through periods where he struggled. And generally speaking, when men go through tough times like this, they go through it alone. And there can be many things that cause this dark season in their life. It may be them losing their job or their income. Their whole identity was in their job or their income, and it's now taken away from them. And now they are in a pit, or their wife leaves them or cheats on them, and they are now in a pit, or their loved one dies or their dreams are shattered. The vision for their life never came to fruition, and now they are just not even living. They are existing, just passing the time while they are in a pit, a pit of despair, a pit of hopelessness, a pit of desperateness. Allow me to read a narration of where David was at the edge of falling into the pit. First, Samuel 31 through to 6. And it came to pass, when David and his men were come to Ziklag on the third day, that the Amalekites had invaded the south, and Ziklag and smitten Ziklag, and burned it with fire, and had taken the women captives that were therein. They slew not any either great or small, but carried them away and went on their way. So David and his men came to the city, and behold, it was burned with fire. And their wives and their sons and their daughters were taken captives. Then David and the people that were with him lifted up their voice and wept until they had no more power to weep. And David's two wives were taken captives, Ahanom and Jezreelites, and Abigail, the wife of Nabal and Carmelite. And David was greatly distressed, for the people spake of stoning him, because the soul of all the people was grieved every man for his sons and for his daughters. But David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. Encourage yourself when you have no one to count on. Encourage yourself. Pick yourself up from the floor and encourage yourself in the Lord your God. I am going to get out of this situation. I am not going to be defeated. I will not give up. When other people give up, I will not surrender when other people surrender, no matter how challenging the circumstances. I will press on with courage and faith in your situation today. Encourage yourself in the Lord. You will get through this. I want to encourage you today to keep fighting, to keep pushing forward, and to not give up. Choose to keep fighting even if it feels like everything is working against you. Choose to keep pushing forward even when it feels like you're not making progress. Choose to keep going when it seems like you can't go anymore. David was the type of man that would get better in the battle. When you have no one to count on, when you are struggling, when you are alone and in a pit of despair and hopelessness, it is a lie that men do not have emotions. Even the strongest of men have emotions. And when you are knocked down by life, it is okay to feel those emotions. But learn from the warrior King David and encourage yourself in the Lord his God. Get up and fight. Get up and fight. Get up and fight. Get up and try again. Get up and encourage yourself in the Lord. Lie number two. Lie number two, money, power, and a promiscuous life is what a man should want in their life. Lie. Number two. Living promiscuous life is manly and will satisfy you. In 2018, Cole Newton published some interesting comments on the book of Ecclesiastes. He highlighted the major experiences Solomon had gathered before writing the book. Solomon was a man to whom God had given everything. He was the epitome of the American dream. In terms of political power, Solomon was greater than the President of the United States. In terms of religious authority, Solomon had more than the Pope in terms of intelligence. Solomon had more than Einstein in terms of wealth. Solomon surpassed Bill Gates. We are told that the daily provisions for his personal staff were enough to feed 35,000 people, 1 Kings 4, 22, and 23. That's 35,000 servants that waited on him hand and foot. Solomon had it all. In addition, God granted Solomon a peaceful reign on the throne of Israel for 40 years. First, 
Kings 11.42, that is the longest time of, that Israel has ever seen. Not only did countries not attack Israel, but also during Solomon's reign, they came from all across the globe just to give him money. Solomon was a man known all across the world. He was not the average man. He experienced all corners of life and the things people aspire to. The opening words of the book of Ecclesiastes are enough for everyone to ponder on for the rest of their lives. Ecclesiastes 1, 1 and 2. The words of the preacher, the son of David, king of Jerusalem, vanity of vanities, saith the preacher, vanity of vanities. All is vanity. Vanity is a key word used in the book of Ecclesiastes. The word vanity is used 38 times in the book of Ecclesiastes. The author uses this word to describe the fleeting and transitory nature of life and the pursuit of material wealth and worldly pleasures. He suggests that these things are ultimately meaningless and will not bring lasting satisfaction or happiness. The word vanity in this context can be understood to mean emptiness, worthlessness, and futility. The central theme of the book is the pointlessness of human activity and goals without God. The book reveals that God is the only essence of our lives. Whatever you do outside of Him amounts to nothing at the end of life. Pursuing the things of this world is like chasing the wind, if God is not your driving force. The baffling reality is that, although Solomon achieved everything his heart desired, he never found satisfaction and fulfillment in any of them. Solomon had more money than a person can dream of, yet he describes it as vanity, empty. What the wealth promised to deliver failed. It was empty and vain. Solomon is a man that had 1,000 wives and concubines. He experienced all the lust and pleasures of lust a man can experience. Yet he describes it as vanity empty. What the lust and pleasure promised to deliver failed to deliver. It was empty and vain. Solomon had far-reaching power, power to the point that other rulers would come witness his kingdom. Yet he describes that power as vanity empty. What the allures of power promised to deliver failed to deliver. It was empty and vain. Solomon had all these things, and yet he says something striking. Ecclesiastes 2.17 Therefore I hated life, because the work that is wrought under the sun is grievous unto me, for all is vanity and vexation of spirit. Narrating his adventures, Solomon recounted how he drank wine in excess, built houses, planted vineyards, made gardens, and planted trees and flowers. He also made pools of water and amassed multitudes of servants, both males and females. He had greater possessions of cattle than anyone else that ever lived before him. In Jerusalem he gathered silver and gold. He had several musicians and musical instruments in his palace. There was no sort of pleasurable thing Solomon desired that he did not taste, see, feel, or handle. Yet there was no satisfaction in all these things. He hated life. There are things deeper than pleasure. There are things deeper than the lust, wealth, and power of this world. Christ Jesus Christ. Do you know there are millionaires and even billionaires who are unhappy with their life? You would think that if you had $10 million in your bank account, you would be joyful. You would be happy. The truth is, yes, if you had that money, some of the problems you are facing will be fixed. However, there are millionaires and billionaires who are miserable, all the money at their disposal but miserable. The truth is, there are some things money can't buy. Money cannot give you the assurance of salvation. It cannot give you the joy of the Lord. It cannot give you the gift of eternal life. It cannot give you the joy of fellowship and communion with God. There are people who are living for pleasure and living sinful lifestyles that gives them some amount of pleasure, but the pleasure of sin never satisfies. It never satisfies. It may give you some pleasure for a limited amount of time, but it fades. It also fades. Learn from Solomon. Solomon's narrative can help us understand the words of Jesus in Matthew 16:26, which says, 
For what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Jesus describes the greatest vanity here, that after a man has pursued the things of this world and has gotten hold of them, he should lose his own soul. There is nothing in this life that has, is eternal value. It is only the relationship you build with Christ in this life of vanity that will speak for you in eternity. As Solomon rounds up his message, he tells us of the summary of God's expectation from humanity in Ecclesiastes 12.12-14, 12 through to 14, saying, And further by these, my son, be admonished of making many books. There is no end, and much study is a weariness of the flesh. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter, fear God and keep His commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. The fear of God is a forgotten principle. The fear of the Lord is a healthy reverence and respect for God's power, majesty, and authority. He understood that without the fear of God, we are all prone to wander off the path of righteousness and fall into sin.